Edge, welcome setup. back to the. <laughs> Wait, what did you say? Your setup is hilarious, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, welcome back to the Joyous Kingdom. I'm Cage, your guide. I'll be replacing the voice exaggerated for now, giving you a break from the constant internal monologue that is the human mind. I want to say first thing for listening or viewing on whatever platform you're on. If you haven't already, smash the like button for me, subscribe to the channel. Join the kingdom. Today, I'm joined by Luke and Nets, CEO, founder of Pudgy Penguins. Amongst other things, big e dude, big business guy. I won't even have him go through his, his intro because he's gone through it a million times. Honestly, uh, if you guys want to check out all the things he's done, he's he's crushed the entire business world, crushed the entire branding world. Um, he's been doing it for a very, very long time. He's extremely well accomplished. And one of the um, one of the people I've wanted to talk to for a long time. So thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hell yeah. And uh, yeah, we were talking about just a second ago off camera. You've gone on like a massive marketing run. Who uh, have, have any of the shows stuck out to you just out of my own curiosity as a podcast host? Uh, there's been a couple. I really enjoyed Wrecked Radio. I really enjoyed probably my favorite one was Leap. Dude, so that Leap, one was good. Yeah, he, he his questions were just like too good. Like he asked <laughs> what I thought felt like were like all the right questions. And then there was one recently, like Room 101, where they like they switched it up and just like, because I feel like I've been repeating the same stuff over and over. And then I felt like they just kind of hit me with a bunch of like different questions, which is fun. Yeah, yeah, totally, hundred percent. What what are the questions people should avoid you mainly, other than like the tell me about you, give me your short intro. Yeah, I think right now I'm just like really tired of the story. Uh, yeah. So like, <laughs> try to avoid. Though I think it's it's it's. it's, it's like I understand it's inspirational, right? And so like I do want to inspire. Like that is one of my purposes on this planet is to like I, I very much believe like I am the walking testament of the American dream, you know, like coming from nothing, making something out of your life. Like so I don't mind it. I just hope certain people who've listened to all my podcasts or my interviews don't get like uh, annoyed by it. Um, I honestly don't mind. Any question is a fair question. I just, I've, I've said it so many times now. And, and the reason why it bothers me is because I know my mom hates that I share this story. So like, she's ashamed. Does she? That, yeah, she hates it. Cause she's like, why are you telling people we were homeless? Like, oh, she has, she has cause it's like, she's not, we're not proud of it, obviously. And she's definitely not proud of it. Um, but I think it made me the person I am today. So like, you know, I share it. Dude, tell me, tell me about that relationship with your mom. Is that like, has that, has that ever gone through like a rocky time where y'all like weren't talking at all? Was there any, especially with, with the business world, dude, like I'm, well, I, I know for a fact you understand this, like just shutting off complete tunnel vision. Can you take weekends? Are you able to disconnect? Can you connect with the family and stuff like that? Yeah. So me and my mom are super close now. Like that's my woman. Like that's like the most awesome person in my life. Like when it comes to like a like a female influence. Like I do any, everything I do in some respect is for her growing up though. I absolutely hated her. Like me and her had real beef growing up. And really? I just, basically just, yeah. Cause I blamed her for this awful life that we had. I was like, dude, like, you know, life shouldn't be this bad. Like why, why do we have to do this? And nobody else does. And in hindsight, I'm thankful for the way that we grew up because like that made me who I am. And like, I like my life. I love my life. Yeah. And so, you know, if it wasn't for that stuff, then I wouldn't be here today. And who knows how things would have shook out. But uh, growing up was really tough. I mean, I think my, all my teenage years, like we would fight. Like my mom was one of those that totally believed in like beating the shit out of us. And so uh, like it was just like a complete like disaster of a household for five, yeah. six years. And, um, you know, once I became older and like in hindsight, dude, I had no I, I have no idea how she did it. Like no matter what do I accomplish in life? Like how she was able to take care of two boys with like no green card, no ability to work, like, and like we weren't like legit in shelters. Like that's the one thing we always had a roof over our head. Now it wasn't our roof; it was somebody else's. Mm -hmm. But like we never like spent nights in shelters and shit. You know, like we she, she always would figure it out. And in hindsight, I will never be able to accomplish what she accomplished. And like understanding that responsibility and understanding the expenses, like. For 20 years, her bank account would go to zero at the end of every month. Like, I have no idea what that, like, feels like or what that means. Yeah. So, mad respect to her for making it happen. Dude, yeah, honestly, it's only, it's only probably been um, a couple, probably in the last, like, two years that I've kind of woken up to the fact that my parents are also their own entire human being with an entire life with drama and fucking coworkers and shit. And I was just like, it's, it's so wild that we never considered that in any capacity. Um, yeah, no, it, yeah, it, that's funky. 
Um, is she? Oh, oh yeah, I was gonna ask this. Um, is she like from here? I forget if if uh, from the story if she's like came from somewhere else or if she's from here. Yeah, she's from Europe, France more specifically. So you know, we have I have French blood. I'm an American. I was born in America. Um, but she she herself is not from America. Gotcha. Yeah, my mom's Japanese, and I think uh, for the Japanese people, at least they struggle to communicate emotions sometimes. So like growing up, wasn't quite sure. I was like, yeah, I'm like I'm like pretty sure you love me bro. But like, <laughs> I don't know, you know, like you yell at me a lot and you tell me to do the dishes too much and stuff like that. And this, I guess it's kind of how it is. And yeah. Like growing up, same thing. We just butted heads all the time. Didn't really realize how difficult shit was. I mean, she was like literally younger than me when she had me and that makes no sense in my head. Like I can't even get a girlfriend right now. Um, speaking of which, bro, you got, a, you, you got a, you got a little honey at home. Yeah. I got a honey at home. True. Right on. That's awesome. That you're able yeah. to, to balance and not post all over the place, you know? Yeah. You're so funny, dude, with the thing on your head. I'm just telling you, it just <laughs> makes it so much more enjoyable. You have no idea. Bro, I, I wore these. Do you know the origin story with these glasses? Mm -mm. So I wore these. Uh, there was a Halloween bit that I was doing, and I was wearing a different – I don't even know what it is. It was the very beginning of my YouTube thing, and it was like anything was working in the bull run. I just thought it was working because it was the mask, and I was wearing all these random masks. And then I ran out, so I had these glasses a couple extra times. And then in thumbnails, I noticed that they did well, a little bit better with the ones with the glasses. So I just stuck with it. And then um, I think like one person recognized me and I was like, done. That's it. I'm just going to roll with the glasses. That'll work. I don't know that much about branding. I know enough. And this will, this, I'll just roll with this. Um, and speaking of that, dude, so you've gone on a bunch of recent podcasts, not to completely switch subjects, but one thing you said, which caught my interest because you had, uh, you had Mo on or no, Mo had you on and y'all were talking about just uh, all the things. And he's, you mentioned that if OpenSea doesn't do it right, if they're not doing the things you may, you may come in and, and do something there in that world. Was, is that, is that for real? You think you could do that? No, I mean, I think the, the debate with Mo was, you know, OpenSea at the time was contemplating removing royalties, which they now said they're not going to remove. And so I was basically really frustrated. Like OpenSea is the thought leader in this space mm -hmm. for marketplaces. And, you know, if they were to move off of royalties, royalties would become obsolete. Yeah. And so, you know, knowing that I was just like, hey. Like if you guys take away royalties, just know everybody and their mom is going to get into the marketplace business, including myself, and we're going to beat mm -hmm. you guys. And that, you know, I've, I have no intent and no desire to get in the marketplace business. I think OpenSea <laughs> does a phenomenal job. And I would love OpenSea to keep doing what they're doing. Yeah. But if they remove totally. royalties, it's, it's I got to come in because, you know, that's part of the beauty of the space. Yeah. You got to have royalties. Dude, also, yeah, after, after going on those shows too, have you ever felt like, you were mischaracterized or like you, maybe you said something and then afterwards you were kind of like, damn, maybe I came off this way. And, or are you kind of just like, uh, well, I hope people, I hope, I hope when I speak, people don't think like I'm arrogant or I'm not like some like snobby little shit. Like <laughs> I, 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 I try to be really confident because I don't believe that people can believe like, how can somebody believe in pudgy penguins or believe in me if I'm not, the greatest believer of pudgy penguins or the greatest believer of myself. And so one thing that I just wanted to make clear, uh, and since you asked, I think it's a great question. Uh, I want people to know that like, I do come from humble beginnings and like, I am like a realist and, but, but I believe so much in this and uh, I, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure this wins. Uh, I just feel like sometimes people mistake confidence for arrogance. Yeah. Uh, or the ability to believe in yourself or something a little more malevolent or, you know, not as genuine when it's like totally not the place my, my perspective comes from. I just have this undeniable belief that I'm going to win here and that like I have the project and the community and the IP to do that. Dude. And something that is, I feel like I maybe noticed it cause I've watched a ton of your podcasts, but when you do say the same thing over and over again, it's, you get that Gary Vee effect where you can't help, but kind of like, just you just kind of buy in even though like even if you don't like if you don't if you, like you're not a fan of Luke and that's you hear him over and over and you're like all right well fuck it, it seems like he's probably just gonna win so like we should probably just buy in like we should probably ape in right and people are like yeah we should do that um and i remember gary v uh, a few like maybe it was like a month ago he posted this podcast i don't know if you saw with him and his childhood best friends it was like him and three buddies from like when he was seven years old and they just started telling stories about what gary v was like when he was a kid and to hear them say Man, motherfucker, make me get up at six in the morning on a Saturday night and like go up and like do garage sales. And I, I literally, it was the most gratifying feeling knowing that Gary was the same with or without money before he was Gary V. And I think it's the same. Like the comments you have right now, I actually this is interesting. Were you 
were you did you have a similar approach to all this stuff when you were on the come up versus when you kind of had that bag and you kind of had done the thing and made some money, sold a business, things like that? Dude, I knew I was a beast um, since I was a young kid. Like, I don't know what what it was. And I know some people feel this way too. Like, I knew I was going to be rich. Like, the people who really knew me knew I was going to be rich. Like, like I, I, I was going to do it. Like, I was a hustler. I did everything that I can. Like, the second I was able to even, the second I understood money, I wanted to make it. Um, I really devoted my life to that. Do you remember that first little moment? I remember getting a $20 bill once and being like, holy shit, that's a lot of money. My grandparents laughed at me. Yeah, a lemonade stand was sick, but I think probably the the moment where I just really fell in love with money was this guy named Mark Packer. I was watching this kid, Harry, uh, babysitting, and I was like 10 or like 13 or something like that. I forget exactly how old I was, and he gave me 200 bucks, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is the greatest cool. moment. Yeah, Mark Mark owns a company called Tao, which is like this huge group. So he's like, he's retardedly loaded. He's like two hundred bucks. <laughs> uh, That's but awesome. he gave me that, and I was like, oh yeah, this is this is amazing. Hell yeah, dude! And ba- and that that was a, a long time ago. I remember you had mentioned you worked at Ring for a little bit when they kind of first started. What was your what was like your role there? And did you like pull any mentors from that from that world specifically, or any like specific things that you remember that kind of uh, impacted you? Yeah, I was an RMA and Q&A, so not really anything high level. But one of my mentors, a guy named Nolan, who was one of the lead engineers, and um, he kind of took a like to me and just kind of took me under his wing. And it's been a beautiful story ever since. Legend, legend. Um, also, this is something that popped up. This is actually someone, I forget if this is in Twitter or Discord, so whoever asked this question, it's a good one. Were you on social media at all before and did you have any interest in making anything on social media that wasn't 100% funneled back for business or some, some business related venture and why not? Yeah. Why? So basically personal brand and content creation. I mean, it's definitely, I dipped and dabbled, right? Um, I don't know. I just haven't been, I haven't gotten over. I, I regret it in hindsight, something I wish I would have done. Really? Right. I wish I would have made, yeah, I wish I would have made content more because don't underestimate the power of the personal brand. I mean, you look at Elon Musk, you yeah. look at some of the top entrepreneurs in the world, they've been able to expedite this because of their personal brand. True. And so I was somebody that like, I learned early on that like rich people are supposed to be in the shadows and you don't want fame and fortune. You really just want fortune. And so I let that brainwash me for the first couple of years when I start to, started to make it. And then I started sharing like who I was in the world a little bit and it exponentially improved my businesses. And then I was like, mm. oh yeah. And I just never really doubled down like I should have. Uh, but maybe you'll start seeing that in the near future. You know, Alex Hormozzi and Layla Hormozzi both said something similar, especially Alex. I remember a clip where he was like, man, I was doing fine. I, did, I had no qualms with social media, blah, blah, blah. And then Kylie Jenner becomes a billionaire. And he goes, and then I was like, what the fuck? Because she's like 20 or something. Um, thoughts on Alex and Layla Hormozzi? You got any? Do you, do you watch their content at all? Yeah. Alex Ramosi is one of the few goats. Like I, I, I know everybody in the like guru space. Uh, like I'm, I'm like really tapped in there. They're all fugazis. Mm-hmm. Like all fugazi fugazis preach this like word that they're the beast, that they're good, and they're really just like upselling you on their like info product, and that's really where they're making their money. Mm-hmm. Alex Ramosi is like one of three of them who's like the real deal, like the real deal, holy field, like a real tried and true, complete beast. And like everything that comes out of his mouth, you you, you listen close. It's mm-hmm. The school's in session. I mean, I believe you could study Alex Ramosi's Instagram and learn more on Alex Ramosi's Instagram than you could at Wharton School. Yeah, I agree. I'm a, firm, I'm a firm believer in that. Like, why would you ever go to Wharton with Alex Ramosi's Instagram page live? Just study that thing a hundred times, take notes, and you'll come out of there a monster and go get some experience. And that'll do you better than four years of Wharton. I'm a f- firm believer in that. Um, if- so he's one of the few that I think are just like go to the goats when like there's a, a majority of these cats are fugazis. They'll live. Yeah. I mean, what it's like to make money on an info product is very simple. It's not even hard to do. So, yeah, I've heard, uh, especially from some of the guys that are super, super high level, they're like the work just isn't that fun. They're like, it's not it's not glorious. You kind of just do a bunch of stuff and money just shows up because you know what you're doing. Uh, this is an interesting question that someone had brought up to me once that. I, I guess I've kind of contemplated, but I've never actually thought about deeply. Do you think there's any inherent value in listening to people that are so far above where you're at, where they literally don't 
I mean, I can remember what it was like to be as a beginner in like the NFT space, but sometimes I can't actually put myself in those shoes. And so sometimes I worry that when I say things about NFTs, I forget and I skip a bunch of levels for brand new people. Do you think anyone who's like a very, very brand new at entrepreneurship can learn anything from someone so far above, or do they have to listen to people who are just a couple steps above? No, a hundred percent. You, you've got to dream bigger. You got to think more, you got to want more. And like the only way you're going to do that is by listening to the best of the best. And at the end of the day, the best, the best are going to have the best advice. Some of it's going to be applicable. Some of it is not, but it's up to you to have the wherewithal to apply the things that make sense and to not apply the things that don't. Mm, true. You got any role models? Uh, not necessarily, but somebody like Alex Ramosi would definitely fall into that category if I did, where it was just like, oh yeah, like very few times do I feel like the student anymore. As mm. young as I am, I feel, I feel like I'm the teacher all the time. And so when I listen to Alex, I'm like, okay, I'm a student. Yeah. Let's not student because you've just got an absolute and and you can just tell he's just so well rounded. He's got his wife, he's got like a beautiful life, and you can just tell like it's even beyond business. Like that's just somebody that every young man should look up to like mm -hmm. you should I, and i don't say that about anyone really like i think alex Ramos is one of the few men that like i think young men should look up to because he's just a beast yeah no one uh i agree there right there one sec Give me two seconds three two one and we're back Hopefully it doesn't happen again. Just replace that wire. Um, yeah, I would say Alex, definitely Alex Ramosi. Well, I don't even know if I wanted him to be a role model. He just became the role model because he took over Instagram. Bro. <laughs> like that, that man literally went from, I know people were saying he was online and like people like Andrew Tate where they were online for a few months ago, but I'm like, were they though? You know, I'm like, I, I really didn't see them. And then they just kind I, of I followed off. Tate. You know, I followed Tate for years when he had like 20,000 followers and I had followed him for here. years. So I was familiar with both. Tate's, Tate's come up wasn't, Tate's come up was just like, it's like you have a perfect example. You have like Hermosi, who's like the real top G. Yeah. And then you have a clown that is Tate, right? Because Tate is quite literally a clown. And you have like these two and it's like, okay, one did it the right honest way and blew up the right honest way. He's making less money, but like, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And then you have this super clown who's like Tate, just a clown, you know? And it's just like, all right, like, you just blew up because you said wild shit and you put the machine. He did say a lot of wild shit, dude. He said some crazy stuff. And it's funny because, like, dude, that shit just caught, like, fire, bro. Like, all these kids, too. They just – I don't know what it is. They just love hearing this stuff. I mean, I get, I get, I guess I get it. Um, I guess I'm still shocked at, like, the level of, influ of influence he has because kind of like you were saying a, a second ago, um, the idea of, like uh, – repeating yourself over and over again. I figured that at some point it just wouldn't hit the same. And bro, dude, the, the Tate Cobra army is just so strong. It's just sad, dude. It's just sad. Like I just really empathize. Like I put it on my story the other day. I took a screenshot of Tate. He was basically calling all women broke. He was like, women are brokies. They're incapable of making money. And I put the screenshot and I said, do any of you guys look up to Tate? And 60% said yes, and 40% no, said no. I was like, bro, you guys got some serious balls voting on this poll with this screenshot where I can see exact, but you want to know what I noticed? Here's an interesting observation, Kate. I, I actually spent like 20 minutes on this. I was like, I went through all the profiles that said yes, and I went through all the profiles that said no. All of the bosses said no. All of the kids <laughs> who hadn't made it yet said yes, right? So girls and bosses, like real successful individuals were like, no clown behavior mm. right and then like all of the gut people that said yes were all boys but they were boys they weren't men right yeah. they were all like boys that had maybe you know i think the best was like one kid that i knew probably just like made his first million bucks a couple months ago so you oh, can yeah. see like the high level real deal cats are like bro that's like clown behavior we see right through it like that's the thing so like okay tate has the respect of like people who are like struggling in life that are confused but like dude tate can't go to fucking the silicon valley and like bro they'll look at him like bro get out of here yeah like yeah shoot. you know what i mean so like what is it like where's the, he's no respect from real influence like real influence doesn't respect tate like it's the kids who haven't figured it out yet who don't know life who have been brought up in a certain way that like blame women for breaking their heart like that are just like insecure that like are like oh yeah i look up to that guy 
Yeah. And the thing is, the problem with Tate is like 90% of what he says is like really facts. Like he, he'll drop some like serious game, but then it's the 10% that invalidates it all. I don't care how much facts your 90% that you drop. It's like if the other 10% is just pure nonsense, then it like, then I don't care what you said. You know, yeah. you're debunked because of your nonsense. That's just how it is. It's funny because in the Web3 communities, we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of support for Koba. I think it's because of his ability to sell that dream. Like he's fucking good at making you feel like, oh, what the fuck? All right, well, okay, I'm just gonna cut it off. We're just gonna switch over entirely. All right, camera. All right, we're switching off. We're going rogue. We're going rogue, guys. The camera, I don't know, is failing me today. I was gonna say, so in the Web3 community though, they, uh, I'm seeing a ton of people who are who are big fans of Tate. And I think it's because of that selling the dream thing. I, I guess there's probably no surprise that that's literally the NFT world is basically selling that dream and seeing if you can. Um, yeah, half of web half of web three today are just casino participants people who are looking to get rich quick and the people that follow tate or, and the people that are buying as hustler university or whatever just want to get rich quick like everybody like you know that that's why i think there's similar audiences because it's just like hey like we just want to get rich quick we just want to figure it out right like there we want an easy way yeah and you'll be so surprised the easy way the easy way will not come well, I remember when I was starting to do YouTube and I, I the reason I got in, honestly, into NC space at all in last August was because I, all I saw online was people making top 10 projects, what to buy tomorrow to, to moon and be rich tomorrow. And I kept seeing all those videos. And I was like, all right, I see some of these people like Giancarlo who are making like good respectable content where I feel like if he walked into a room with a bunch of successful, wealthy people, whatever, he would at least be able to not go in there and, and feel like a loser because he, they, they know that he's legit or something. And I, I always chase that kind of respect how you were saying when, when Cobra Tate walks into a room, you know, people might respect his like social media standpoint where he's at there. But as far as the things he says, they all know that he's, he's preaching to a bunch of the, like 14 year olds. And so right. the respect isn't quite there. I always chase the respect. I was curious on your thoughts on that because I think chasing respect is great for building your brand. It's not the best for like building numbers and hype. Like where does that line come from when you're like building brand and respect and then marketing? Promoted. This is a very, this is very, actually, Kate, I'm impressed. This is a high level question. This is like a real deep, full, you know, I, I mean, deep, full. I mean, this is a real deep and thoughtful question, actually. And, th and that's the caveat, right? Because, like, even me, for example, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I have a Rolls Royce, right? Oh, uh, I have, like, I, 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 <laughs> no, but, but, like, I'll give you an example because it's like, like, I don't want to post a picture of me standing in front of my Rolls Royce, but I know yeah. that's good marketing. Right. I know it's good marketing that I'm 24 years old and I have a half a million dollar car with an orange interior and me standing in front of it is going to oh get views and exposure and engagement, which at the end of the day is going to help me build my personal brand versus me sitting in front of the mic, you know, giving you 99 cents worth of game that is just like super impactful. And mm -hmm. so it, it's a really interesting line. I think, I think there's just that polar, there's that polarity where it's just like, don't do things that hurt other people, right? If you're going to market, like I think, and, it, and don't worry, like you, like people think that like, dude, sometimes I cringe at my Instagram, like dude, standing in front of a Rolls Royce, like who do you think you are? Like fake rapper, right? But that's really not what I'm trying to go for. I'm really just trying to play into that marketing angle because I know that's what people want to see. Uh, and I know that's what's going to like drive engagement. So like I'm leaning into that, but I think the the line here is just like, don't, go so far down the marketing rabbit hole where you're beginning to hurt other people because of it. So like when I stand in front of my Rolls Royce and I, and like no one's getting hurt because of that, I'm not mm -hmm. offending anyone. Right. And it's also kind of the way that I frame it too. Like I'm not, I'm not saying, Hey, what color is my Rolls Royce? What color is yours? You know what I mean? Oh, you don't have one. You're a fucking loser. See, that's what Tate does. Tate um, leans into the insecurities of men and makes them feel really bad about themselves. And then has created the solution that is this phony scam of an info product. Right. And so like it just it's leaning into pure insecurity. I mean, it's literally like if you whether you like to admit it or not, if you've bought in Tate's Hustler University, it's because you're insecure. Like I'm just telling mm -hmm. you, you're, I would tell you that if I bought it. Right. And then just I'm leaning in as, as a young man. When I was 15, I would have bought Tate's thing. Why? Because I was an insecure little boy. It's the same thing. Right. Um, but it just leans into the thing. 
life is not about hurting people or make people feel bad or making people feel lesser. Like the second you start doing that is the second you start misinterpreting life. Right. And like, that is not our purpose as human beings. At a minimum, we have to make the world a better place, but you also got to do what you got to do to kind of push your brand forward. And so for me, yeah. um, I think that's a really thoughtful question. I think that really the caveat there is like, you know, at all times, make sure you're a good human being and you preach a good word because that will always garner respect. The reason why Tate has no respect is because every rich person knows that money doesn't mean shit, but he's still a slave to the money. I mean, Tate's probably got what, four or 500 million bucks now at least. Yeah, like, that's why are you still a slave to the money, dude? Why are you still saying this reckless shit on Twitter? Because he like wants more. It's like, how much more do you really need? You don't understand money. You're a slave to money. He's caught in the matrix as much as he's telling you to get out of it. Because it's like, dude, at what point are you going to realize that life is not about how much fucking money you have? I mean, dude, what's the difference between a billion and three billion? It's not really that much. You know, okay, like bigger boats, bigger yachts. Like, dude, like how fulfilling is that really? Not that fulfilling, truthfully. Have you bought anything that was fulfilling? Please tell me yes, because like I'm hoping. Yeah, and, it, and it's always been for people that wasn't myself. So whenever I bought things for other people, it was super fulfilling. Like when I like, like, yeah, I mean, dude, I the stupid Rolls Royce is a waste of money. I mean, totally not fulfilling. It was a dream of mine for so long because I got the truck. I got like the bad boy, you know. Let's and go. So, um, he and then I just like I as stupid. That's why I just don't get it. I don't get people that are still caught in that rat trap. Mm. I guess they think that like the next thing will work. Maybe this one will work and they just keep yeah, trying. It won't. it won't. So interesting. Is there, do you think there's an amount of money that you could identify for like a typical person, uh, probably a dude. Cause you're a dude, um, that makes you feel quenched or it's like, okay, I'm, I'm good. I'm all right. Is there a number you think? I think it's a hundred million. Hundred million? You think that's the point where you're like, I'm good. How about you think for a normal person, say hundred million? Uh, for no, I mean, dude, I was a normal person, and when I crossed ten, I was like, yeah, mm. this ain't shit. Ten doesn't. Oh. Move the so you would, if you would think it's ten, right? So ten would be the number, and then you realize, oh wait, ten is not that much because ten isn't that much. So like ten, like okay, you you, I mean, at, at least not like ten. You can't go travel the world and eat, stay at the best places and, you know, first class, every flight, you know, by the time you, you do that for a couple of years, you'll be at like eight mm -hmm. and then you're like, Oh shit. And then you buy a house and then you're at, then you pay taxes and then you're at like five and then you have property tax and then living. And then it's like, Oh, I got to live on a budget from now until the day I die. And then, yeah, I mean, it's weird to think about, but you'd be surprised how much your behavioral pattern changes once you make money. But I thought 10 would be the number. Then I had 10. I was like, Oh yeah. hundred is probably the number realistically. It was hundred. You can put 50 in the S&P and just make your 5 to 10% a year and just live off that. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, where is your money now? I guess it's probably all into, into pudgies. I mean, you pulled the trigger and you spent 700 ETH. Um, you jumped in into the pudgy penguins world. And so I assume, like, are you are you thinking about retirement? I feel like our generation almost just said fuck it to retirement and said that we're just going to spend our money now and try and make it so that you don't need a retirement. That's like the mentality I've picked up from my generation. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, dude, if I spent all my money on Pudgy, I'd be in a bad spot. I definitely well, no, okay, not all your money on Pudgy, but I, I'm saying like people my age, I've seen a lot of people in the 20s and 30s at least who literally took some of their money out of their savings or their even their retirement fund to go pursue something because probably because of social media to go try something. What are your thoughts on that? I'm pulling the trigger because it's yeah, pretty fucking take, risky. Yeah, take the risk until you can. I mean, the thing is, as long as you're risk tolerant, take the risk. Pudgy Penguins is a risk, but I'm 24 years old, dude, so I'm like, mm. yeah, I'll go take the risk. Like I have nothing else to lose, you know? Yeah, uh, I can still bounce back. I think it's different once you're 40, 50, you can't take risks anymore. And so while you're young, you have the opportunity to take risks. Now's the time to do it, because if you fail, you'll still have gas in the tank to build it back up. Hell yeah. Right on. All right. So I know we're coming to a close here. I got a couple of uh, fire rapid fire questions. Actually, I have one deep question first. Well, it could, it could be. I don't even know if it's going to be deep. It probably won't be. What are your thoughts, if you have any, on the simulation theory? Are you, are you subscribed to any of those theories where you're like, that's probably, that can maybe be it. And life can be anything and anything. Truthfully, it could be a simulation. We could be puppets of aliens playing video games. I mean, you don't know what you don't know. There's, there's nothing in the world that could disprove any of the latter. So I'm a yeah. firm believer in any of it. True. You at Elon Musk Maxi? Yeah. 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 Because mm -hmm. of, because of what he's willing to do to like conquer worlds and save the world and do the things. Yeah, it's just, it's just like an undeniable beast. I don't care where you stand on the political spectrum. I don't care where you stand. Like, you cannot deny his ability to build amazing companies and to solve the hardest problems. 
Hell yeah. Right on. All right. Is there anywhere you haven't traveled yet that you want to travel to? Asia. Where in Asia? Japan. Let's fucking go. I'm half Japanese. I can confirm it's the coolest fucking place ever, especially Tokyo. I remember when I went, I couldn't even see the fucking street. There were so many people there, but it was, it was unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. Like when I got into Tokyo, I was like, what the hell? Is there a place in, in Japan specifically or just anywhere in that whole area? Right on. All right. Final question. Favorite food chain. Where's Luke and Nets go? It's Saturday. He's he's chilling. He's trying to eat some food. Where are you going? Shake Shack. Shake Shack? Let's fucking go. Right on, guys. That's Luke and Nets, CEO of Pudgy Penguins. We didn't talk about uh, too much about Pudgy Penguins, but honestly, uh, there's enough content about there, but you're going to learn all the things you need to know about Pudgy Penguins. Um, guys, make sure you follow him. Like, the, it's all the stuff down below in the description. Make sure you click the like button. Code worth you made to the very end is, uh, is Pudgy. We'll do Pudgy. Um, Luca, dude, thank you so much for coming on. This was fucking fun. Hopefully, we'll get you back on another day. Later, Cade. Hell yeah. Peace, guys. Till next time, continue to enjoy. Continue to learn and be grateful for your life.